told Kelly the same thing today, right, Kelly? So, hey, man. Hey, man. You never know. You just never know. Hallelujah. Good to see everybody. Hey, man. Hey, man. Miss those that are not here, but it's good to see those of you that are here. And need to continue to pray for Anne, uh, for her shingles, that God will just uh, deliver her from that and uh, be very painful. My wife has had it. Uh, some of you others may have had it. I think Ted's had it too. Haven't you, Ted? Have you had shingles? Teresa. Teresa's the one. I, I got the right family, wrong person. Yeah. <laughs> If you've got uh, if you've got your Bibles, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven, shall we? And we're going to read verses one through ten. Amen. Hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter thirty. I'm out of Philippians. You'll notice that. I may go back to it on Tuesday night. I may uh, teach on Tuesday night from Philippians, but uh, uh, at least for today, we're going to go to Ezekiel. Really enjoyed Terry's message this morning. He uh, preached instead of taught, so uh, that was a little different But for, for Sunday morning. But I really enjoyed his message and uh, the message that God gave him. Amen. How many of you are glad to be here? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 37. Um, passage of scripture that uh, we already sang about today. And uh, that's kind of cool, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't give him my message, so what, what Stephanie picks, she picks. And we just trust that God's going to lead us and, uh, and help us. And uh, Terry's message will fall right in with this as well. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were uh, very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Now, I'm going to have to take this off, and it's kind of a complicated thing because it's kind of wrapped up with my... Uh, <laughs> just... There we go. Amen. We managed that. It's just getting kind of kind of warm here. Maybe just getting warmed up, right? Uh, caused me then there were many in the open valley and lo they were very dry verse 2 and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and I answered O Lord God thou knowest and again he said unto me prophesy upon these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord and thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Just by way of information, I'm not going to read it from the Amplified, but the Amplified always ties in breath with spirit. Just as on in that beginning when God created Adam, he breathed his spirit, the Bible says, into Adam. And so in this passage of Scripture, the Amplified uh, combines the two and makes them to be one, just so you know. And to enter into you, and ye shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know you notice the breath again is tied with living right yes. and ye shall know that I am the Lord and so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone and when I beheld Lo, the sinews of the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, and exceeding great army and let's pray shall we lord i love you so very much thank you lord for your presence thank you jesus that we are able to gather together and worship you lord we need you we sang choruses about it we we talk about it we talk about your power and strength in our life we talk about your wisdom we talk about your need to get come into our lives and deliver us 
to change our thinking, to change our hearts, to change our spirits, to change our direction. Lord, we need you in all of these things. And we need you today, Lord, that you will work within us from your word. Let your word have its desired effect in each one of our lives. I pray right now that we will just have a receptive spirit to all that you would speak to us about. Lord, that your word will be applied in our lives. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. You uh, may be seated. Amen. Uh, Are you hoping for dismissal? (laughs) Well, not this time. You're going to have to stay for just a little bit. Um, There was a fellow that that I looked up and um, just was interested in one statement that he had made one time. I'd seen on uh, YouTube a little clip of something he had said. And the fellow's name is Buzz Aldrich. And most of us, um, you know, who are a little older will know who he was. Uh, But he had made this statement that, uh, that I'd seen. And he said, we need to recapture the vision of space travel. And of course, the U.S. has kind of gotten away from all of that and, and other than the unmanned things that they're sending either to Mars and various places, uh, the idea that they would send people into those places has kind of diminished a little bit. And this is back about 10 years ago or more and that he spoke this. So I went up and I was kind of looking at it again today and, and he, was, uh, he was speaking down in Los Angeles and, and he's a little quite old now and, and uh, he was still, and the title of what he was speaking on was No Dream dream too high. No dream is too high. And I, th- I thought about that for just a little bit. And, and as part of this message, I want you to know that, that the first and most important thing from this passage of Scripture that we can gather is that we have got to have a vision. Amen. The Bible says that, that God took uh, Ezekiel and took him and set him down in the midst of a valley. And it, when he was in the midst of the valley, he had a vision. And, and if we stop there for just a little bit I want you to know that that today uh, all of us need to have a vision and a dream of what God can do in our lives Uh, without it without a vision without a dream and without an understanding of where we're going in the kingdom of God quite likely we will recede to mediocrity we will be at church because we know it's the right thing to do but as far as striving to see what God wants to have for us that striving will cease and we'll just kind of sit back and kind of wait for things to happen and so I want you to see today what God can do in your life, what God can do with you, what God can do through you. I want you to see some things that God has promised you. And as Terry was talking about in the morning session, it's not good just to have a dream and then feel like it, it's never going to come to pass. Because when God gives us a vision, when God shows us something in our lives, God is going to cause it to come to pass. It will happen. It may not happen in the time frame that we we understand it. It may not happen in the way that we understand it, but God will fulfill the things that He has said to us, and He will cause that vision to come to pass. We find in the Old Testament, there were, well, even in the New Testament, that those that had no vision, uh, oftentimes, and the Bible does say in Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people will perish. And uh, in the time of Eli and the high priests, uh, his sons began to uh, do some things that were very evil within the uh, temple. And, uh, and then the Bible says this about that time. It says, there was no open vision. God, for whatever reason, maybe because in it there was no individuals that were willing to receive the vision. Perhaps it was they had gotten into the routine of offering sacrifices, doing all the right things, and, and making all the right moves. And it had become a religion to them rather than a God-motivated thing where God spoke to them. We want God to motivate us. I don't want to be motivated by, by my thoughts or thinking that I can increase or that I will do better. But I want to have a vision based upon what God has spoken to me about. 
I want to know that those things are not just from me. They're not just my thoughts, but that God has spoken to me. And so in the time of Eli, uh, Eli's sons began to sin within the very temple of God because there was no open vision. The Laodicean church, although they claimed that they were able to see and they claimed that they were doing good, God's testimony of them said that they were blind. Now, we're not talking physically blind. They were blind to spiritual things. They did not see what was moving in the spirit world because they were so fixated on all that they had and the, the temporal things that were around them. Brothers and sisters, we need a move of God, not just in our church services, but that touches our hearts and touches our minds and changes us and shows us and motivates us and moves us to get out of our homes and maybe go out and reach for somebody else. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So having eyes to see, we'll notice this often in Scripture, this phrase, having eyes to see, they see not. That means they were meant to see. They were meant to see things. We were designed and made and formed by God. God didn't just speak us into being like He did the animal kingdom that is around us, but God formed us lovingly, creatively, and with great care and detail. And all that is within us and all of our makeup was designed by God. And then God breathed His Spirit into us because we were different. We're not just animals. We're not just going to pass away one day and be gone and form into the dust of the earth and, and it doesn't matter what happens after that. But our spirits will go on. Our souls will go on. And one day when the rapture happens, our bodies are going to be gathered together wherever they may be formed and wherever they may have settled. And God's going to give us, going to give us a, a resurrected body that is going to be like Jesus's. Amen. Three things that a vision does for us when we have it. First of all, it excites us and gives us zeal. It gives us eagerness. In John 2 and 17, the Bible says that Jesus said this, or, or the Bible says this of Jesus, that the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. And, uh, and so he made this statement when he started to look around him and saw what the house of God had become that it was a place for gain, for physical gain and, and for financial gain. And he saw, he had a vision of what the house of God should be like. Because it should not be a place where the secular needs of men and women are, are necessarily met, but it should be a spiritual house, a house of prayer, a house where the Holy Ghost moves, a house where we come in with one thought alone, and that is to worship and reach out and touch an Almighty God. And when Jesus saw that and what it had become, He said, I'm going to change this. And He chased all of those out that were, were thinking that the house of God had become something secular, something, something not spiritual. And we want to make sure that we have that zeal. Listen, the house of God, should, when we come in, there should be something in us that excites us. Amen. I'm going to come into your house, Lord. It's going to be with thanksgiving on my lips. I'm going to come in your house. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. I'm not just going to sit here and hope somebody else touches you so that I can maybe catch the leftovers of what comes from them. God, I'm coming in here because I want to give to you my worship, my praise, my thanksgiving for all that you've done. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So the first thing a vision does, if we have a vision within us, it excites us. It gives us zeal. It also helps us to endure hardships. Everybody say hardships. Now I know none of you have hard times in your lives, but uh, maybe one or two, right? Here and there. Medical, financial, physical, relational. Right? We all have those things. Amen. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, Moses endured seeing him who is invisible. He had a vision, Moses did, of the invisible God that, that had showed him in spiritual terms up on the mountain just a little bit of his holiness, just the, just the very tail end of his holiness, and not even all of it, but Moses in his mind and his heart saw that, that there was something greater than just wandering around through a wilderness, that God had something special in mind for him. And so it says he endured. What did he endure? He endured 
40 years of wandering in a wilderness. He endured 40 years of the children of Israel murmuring and complaining. And every time they didn't have enough water or, or whatnot, they would complain. And then they complained about the manna. And then they complained about the meat. And, they, and constantly they were complaining. For 40 years he led, if, if history is even close to correct, several million Jews through the wilderness. And they followed him until they all died off except for Joshua, Caleb, and brought him to the promised land at the end of that 40 years. He endured all of that, the Bible says, as seeing Him who was invisible. Hebrews 12 and 2 says, Jesus, for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross. He saw something beyond those that were torturing Him, those that were hitting Him, those that were whipping Him, those that were putting the nails in His hands. He saw beyond all of that for the joy. He had a vision of the joy that was set before Him. And because of that, He was able to endure what happened to Him on the cross. Not because, not necessarily because He had to, not because, although He was obedient to the Spirit, but because He saw something greater than what was happening right then and there. Man, I'll tell you, sometimes we, we think if we're living for God, everything should be just fine. We're never going to have problems. We're never going to do this. But I'll tell you something. Once your foot is set and you see a vision and you've seen a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God, when you've seen what God wants to do in this city and what God wants to do through you and the people that God wants to touch through your life, well, I'll tell you, it'll set your foot on that path and you're just going to keep going. Amen. You're not going to turn to the right hand or the left hand or, or worry about things that, that maybe don't suit you. And honest to goodness, as long as we're in this world, there's going to be things that don't suit us. Guess what? Brother Reynolds Sr. used to say this all the time, even up until the very time that he passed away, and he passed away shortly after preaching a revival. can't remember. How old was he? Do you remember? 80, in, his, in his late 80s, I think, wasn't he? And, and, uh, and he said this. He says, you know what? He says, the church is never going to be perfect. It's never going to be the way that we all think it should be. He said, because I'm still in it. Right. Yeah. Amen. We're still, we're still in it. Yeah. And unless one of you has become so Christ-like that, uh, that you're able to walk on this world and, and, and not ever be tempted and not ever make a mistake and not ever offend and not ever do anything wrong, I want to talk to you afterwards to find out just exactly how you got to that place before you were resurrected. Right. Right. Because I want to know. Because I think as long as I'm here, there's going to be some things that, that are going to be wrong about me. And as long as you're here, there's going to be some things that are wrong. But you know what? We can endure all of those things. We can put up with all of that because we have a vision of what is before us and what God has for us. Amen. And the third thing uh, that vision will help us, uh, it, will, uh, it will motivate us. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm hoping that my wife won't watch this. I, I had a vision of what our entryway in our house would look like. Had it all marked down, you know, knew what it's supposed to be like. Now, all of you know I've been, you know, working lots of hours lately. So the last couple of weekends, you know, we tore it all apart. John got in there one day just before I got home the first weekend that she was gone and he got a jackhammer and jackhammered up all the old tile and got it out of there and... <laughs> And he did a good job, you know. Just it was just all in a big rubble pile when I got home, and uh, and so I cleaned it all up and and uh, and started taking you know everything else apart and the closet doors and cut some drywall and and did all of that that first weekend and uh, and then I got my my oldest boy Adam. He came over and on Monday last week, this last week, he uh, laid the, we uh, helped him laid the tile and we laid the tile in the new entryway, right? And uh, then he came Tuesday and grouted it. It was fortunate because he was off all week. So I took advantage of that and claimed him for those first two days. And, uh, and so t when I got home, it was all, you know, I knew what I had to do when I got home. I had to seal all the grout because we had to keep everybody off of it and sealed all the grout and did that on Saturday morning. And, and then I started to put it all back together again because I had a vision yeah. of what that entryway was going to look like when it was done. But it motivated me to do something about it. And I like to, you know, don't anybody put this on Facebook, 
Okay? Because I don't want my wife to see it until she walks in there and sees that entryway done when she walks home on Wednesday. And, uh, and so don't, don't anybody talk about it. Don't come over and take pictures, you know, and what is that, Snapchat or whatever it is, you know. Like, don't do any of that. Just, just leave it. Let her be surprised. I've done this a few times, sometimes to my detriment, but, but most of the time, most of the time it's been a good thing. But it's funny about, about having a vision about what something can be like. Having a vision of what, of what will happen if you do this and if you do that and, and you can say, oh, well, that's going to motivate me. Boy, you'll, you'll wake up in the morning and you're thinking, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to succeed at getting something done that's going to help me reach that vision. That's true. Now, I want you to be careful here because, I, because as soon as you start talking about motivating to do something in the kingdom, everybody's saying works, you don't preach works, don't... Well, let me tell you something. If Jesus had not gone to the cross and been obedient to do the things that were necessary to get him there, none of us would have been saved. But he had a vision. He had a vision of a church. He had a vision of you and me. He saw us saved. He saw our sins washed away. He saw us filled with the Holy Ghost. He saw that and it motivated him to do exactly what was necessary. He could have kept preaching like he did in the first two years. Where everything was about the kingdom and everything was wonderful. But you know in that third year, he began to tell them a little bit different. He began to preach hard to them. And they began to walk away one after the other. Until he turned to his disciples and he said, Are you going to go away too? And they said, How, Where can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. We're just staying right where we are. Because you see, he had a vision. He had a vision of you and me. He had a vision of a church that was going to be powerful that the gates of hell would not prevail against. He had a vision that you and I would be filled with the Holy Ghost to the place where we would be delivered of all of the things that had so hampered us and so held us back. He saw you in that light and it motivated him to do all that was necessary to make sure that it was going to be possible for you. Amen. Going back to our passage of Scripture today that we read. Um, first of all, Ezekiel is taken up and he's placed into the midst of a valley and he's looking down from a, an area of possibly like we would from up on the lookout up here in Port Alberni. Have you ever been up there? Yeah. Many of you have. And uh, every once in a while we'll make a walk and go to the very top there and and look down on the valley and and I can see the church, well, most of it, about three quarters of it, and I can see the field back there. I can see Bill wandering around lighting fires and (laughs) and doing all the... (laughs) And uh, and we can... uh, and then I can look down and I'll begin to pick out everybody's houses that I know of, right? And I'll say, oh yeah, that's them. And, and look at, they're over there. And you can see down and you can see everything. So Ezekiel's up on high enough so that he can look down into this valley. And uh, he looked down there and all he saw was death. That's all he saw initially. Can I just say something? That if all we see is those that aren't living for God and the death that is in them and our vision never exceeds that, we'll never do anything about it. If all you see is the dead and, and without a clue as to whether or not they can live because really we have no idea. I don't know who's going to be saved and who isn't going to be saved. I don't know who's going to say yes to God and who's going to say no to God. And the Bible even says we can't look at their faces and determine by the look on their faces whether or not they will say yes or whether they'll say no. But if all we see is death, it'll stop us in our tracks right at that point where we won't go any further than where we are. And so Ezekiel looking up, or pardon me, looking down and... uh, and uh, all he sees is the impossibilities. As Terry was preaching about Noah today and talking about how they must have made fun of him over that 80 to 100 or whatever it was years that he preached. And uh, because the Bible does say he was a preacher and built and preached and built and preached and built because he saw not just the dead, but he saw what he could do for the living. 
And even if it was just eight, even if it was just Noah and his wife, his three boys and their wives, if that was all it was, it was still worth it for him to build that huge boat. We see sometimes the impossibilities. We don't know what's possible because we haven't yet gotten the rest of the vision. The rest of what God wants to show us. I want to see all of my family living for God. If I don't have that in a vision yet, then... God, show me. Show me them living for God. I don't necessarily and haven't seen all of those God wants to place within this church yet. But I know it's God's will to fill up this building. To the place where we'll have to have multiple services on a Sunday. I believe that's the will of God. Amen. Amen. So, seeing beyond just the death that is around us and I'm talking spiritual death let us go on to the next portion of the vision so the question was presented to Ezekiel in this vision can these bones live and Ezekiel at least is as honest as he can be at this point in time because I'm sure he feels a lot like we do sometimes when we look at people I haven't got a clue, Lord. <laughs> you know, but, but if you're asking me to predict whether or not they're going to be able to live, I just, I, I don't know. So his answer was, Lord, <laughs> safe answer, right? Yeah. He's a good diplomat. Thou knowest. <laughs> Would have been a good government official, right? Yeah. Thou knowest. Yeah. Uh, it's good at sidestepping the question. Uh, Thou knowest. And again he said, verse 4, he says, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. There's a lot of philosophies of man in this world. There's a lot of ways and different ways of interpretation of, of what we understand and what we believe. You know something? Sometimes we just need to put all of that stuff away because it can just get so confusing and just preach the Word. Amen. Amen. Just the Word. Jesus said you must be born again of water and of spirit to enter into and see the kingdom of God. Preach that people need to be born again. Amen. 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 It will save them. It will bring them into the kingdom. And as much as that is a is a as is, is so obvious tied in with what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost when he said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. People need to be born again. They need the experience of knowing God in this way. So preach the word. Amen. Preach the Word. Don't preach philosophies or interpretations or all the rest of it and and get into all of that. Just preach what Jesus said. Preach what Peter said because Peter did have the keys to the kingdom. And so when he opened those doors on the day of Pentecost, he was opening them for all of us, for, for those that were then and those that are now and all of those in between. We still are in that dispensation, the kingdom dispensation. So let's preach the Word. So... God says to Ezekiel, preach what God tells you. Preach what God has shown you. Preach what the Word of God says. And when you see somebody, listen, we can be nice to them, we can take them out for coffee, but sooner or later, we've got to bring them to that place if they don't know God. uh, Preaching, hey, have you been born again? Have you received the Spirit of God in your life? Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? Amen. Hallelujah. We've got to preach what the Word says. And so Ezekiel began to preach. 
And initially when he preached, he talked about uh, uh, breath and he talked about the change that would come into their lives or into these bones. Um, breath and spirit shall enter into you and you shall live. And lo and behold, as he's looking down at the valley and he's looking at all these bones, and you know what? People's lives are a mess nowadays. I don't know if you, anybody realize that. They are. Without God in their lives, their lives are a mess. I don't care how much money they've got. I don't care how much popularity or how much power they've got. I want you to know people's lives are messed up. And it's not the way that God meant it to be. God meant it to be that, that the family would be an entity where, where He would be the head of the household and the children would be raised to love God and serve God. And they'd be brought to Sunday school and they'd be, they'd be taught the Word of God. And when they grew up, they would not depart from that. He meant it when He said that the church should be a body, that it should not just be a, a group of people that gather together, but there are cells that are joined together because they are in unity and they are the body of Christ. He meant that to happen. He meant it to be that way. And so when we get to that place where, where we begin to preach to them, hey, I want you to know that if, you're, if your marriage is a mess right now, I know a God that can make it right. God can put your life back together again. I know if there are things in your life that you're addicted to or that you've got habits in your life, I know a God that can deliver you because you see God delivered me from those things as well. And we can begin to preach those things and we can begin to show how Jesus mended lives and fixed lives and made whole those that, were, that came close to Him and those that touched Him. And we can show all of that as Ezekiel's preaching and Bones began to move. Yes, right. yes. Amen. And bones began to attach themselves one to another, finding their proper mate and, and joining up with them and, and continuing to join it. And there's little bones and big bones and they're moving around. And I don't know about you, but, but I mean, they, think about it. Yes. And have you ever seen that thing, uh, the body works thing? Have any of you ever seen that? Yeah. It's like a cross section of everything that's in the human body, and they make all these. And and we went to one airport. My, I can't remember who it was. Whether it was Adam and I or my wife and I, and and in the airport they had all these displays. And what it is is it just shows. It did not look pretty to start with. Yes, no. The bones come together, and then you begin to have all the sinew and the tendons, and and the organs begin to be formed, and and uh, and. All of those things and then finally, thankfully, the skin begins to form over top of it all. And for some of them, hair grew. And they began to look normal. Not with or without hair. Just, just, it kind of came in the wrong context. Even those of us that are bald, Andy, we still look normal. Because it's normal for us, right? <laughs> it is what it is. What is it? Is it just you and me, Andy? Are we the only bald men in this place? Apparently. Man, oh man. And, uh, and so Ezekiel's looking down at this group of people, these dry bones that had been there when he started preaching, and, they're, and now they look good. Yeah, right. That's right. But you see... It's much more than helping people to look good. Yeah. That's, right. That's, right. That's right. This is much more than even getting people to act right yeah. and walk right yeah. and do right yeah. and be moral and be ethical. Right. 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 It's much more than that because if that's all it is then there's lots of places out there that will help you to to live and they'll give you support you know you know they'll they'll support you in in helping to change your life and and make you a better uh, product of society and, and and a benefit to the society that's around you but that's not what the church is all about that's not what God is all about because you see, they still lacked. They looked good. Yeah. They were whole. But they lacked one thing. Yeah. The breath, the spirit. I sometimes think that we make a mistake when we pray for people to get the Holy Ghost. I've looked at this passage of Scripture and uh, we had an evangelist that uh, 
can't remember his name, used to have thousands get the Holy Ghost in his crusades uh, overseas. Passed away. Uh, ah, there you go, Billy Cole. And, uh, and he used to do things differently. He would, he would, they would have thousands in the Philippines or Africa or wherever he preached. And, uh, and he would, uh, you know, lead them in repentance and, and uh, you know, tell them that God, now God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. And, and then he would just say, just almost what Ezekiel, now be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost would fall. And they would have thousands at a time filled with the Holy Ghost. I think sometimes we beg, we beseech, we, we try and plead with God to do what God wants to do and God's promised to do when we should be doing what Ezekiel prophesied. Okay, prophesying to the four winds. Okay, come and fill these now. Come and fill these now. Hallelujah. And the Holy Ghost fell on the valley that Ezekiel was looking over. And the, where they were lying, where they looked good and, and all the rest of it, and, 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 and it, to our eyes might have been perfect, but they had no spirit. And the Holy Ghost came and filled them and the breath of God came into that those that were laying there. And they rose up a living, mighty, great army that God had intended that they be. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am looking forward to what God has yet for us to happen. Amen. I'm looking forward to the next Sunday service that God's going to pour out the Holy Ghost on somebody. Amen. I'm looking forward to filling up our baptismal tank, baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Amen. I remember what that felt like. I remember all the sin and that I was carrying and it was a burden and I remember that the that when I went down in the water it almost felt like you were light when you came out and my spirit was amen how let's stand together shall we hallelujah prophesy to the wind breath or spirit breathe upon the slain that they may live and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. God has given us a vision. Many times we see in the Bible of blind men that came to Jesus say, Lord, I want to see. And for the Laodicean church, the, the Lord said that they should put on ISAB that they would be able to see. Lord, I want to see. I want to see what you can do still through my life. I want to see what you can do through this church in this valley. I want to see the, the, those that are dead or they're just, their lives are a mess to see them come and be, their lives be put back together by the Word of God. And I want to see the Holy Ghost poured out. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord. Let's just close our eyes right now. And let's entertain the presence of the Lord, shall we? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank